Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm so delighted to be able to come here and uh, talk to you about the work that we do and the excitement that we go through in doing the work. And uh, <clears throat> it keeps us going all the time. And uh, you just in the wonderful instruction, uh, in introduction that you gave, you mentioned about the beginning of Grameen Bank. Uh, uh, I had no intention whatsoever of creating a bank or even to go into banking. That is uh, far, far away uh, from my mind. I had never thought I will get involved with banking. Uh, not only get involved with banking, create a whole bank out of it. But that's how I did. That's what happened. So whatever you plan, you are planning right now, uh, watch out. <laughs> you end up with doing something completely different, which you are not even thinking that you do that. Circumstances keep pushing you in the direction that you take. In my case, the circumstances was terrible poverty in the country, and then getting it to the height of it, famine. So teaching economics looked like a, a, a caricature. You know, you, you, you look like somebody uh, who say things which has no meaning. Because uh, all those elegant theories make no sense when you come out of the classroom, you confront those dying people, and you have no clue in the world what to do about it. So that's kind of pushed a young teacher to get out and see if there's anything he can do as an individual, not as an economist, because he felt that the, uh, that didn't give him enough um, grounding in making useful to people. So that was the first kind of uh, accidental, uh, accidental step you take uh, with no expectation whatsoever. You don't know what it means. Luckily, the university that I was teaching was in the middle of villages. All around the campus is the traditional Bangladeshi village. So it was easy for me to get out of the campus and be with the people, real people. So I was trying to see if there is something or anything that I can do to be useful to another person. So then I tried to do little things, whatever I could, every day. That was my mission. That's what I said for myself. I must do something each day to see that I'm useful to another person. So I was always looking to way, find out how I make myself useful. And in the process, what happened to me, that village became a sort of a university for me because I learned so much from that village at each, every step, every, every day, what I do, what I see what I hear, and among many things I learned something very concrete was loan sharking. <laughs> terrible loan sharking that goes into that village. And this is not unique experience, it's everywhere in the world later I see, but at that time in economics we no, never read about loan sharking or what, they were. that's not part of our curriculum, so we, we don't hear. So this, for me, is a revelation. It's right in front of me. I can see it. I can sense it. I can smell it. I can see the impact in a person's life and terrible impact of the loan sharking in poor people's life. So my first reaction was to lend money myself to get people out of the loan sharks, clutches of the loan sharks. And that's the famous thing that People, when they read about Grameen Bank, they said, I started it with $27. That's the first $27 that I lent to 42 people, not just one. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a shocking experience for me that people suffer so much for such a tiny amount, not even a full dollar. And then the excitement that it generated in the village not only simply those 42 families who became 
cleaned out from the sh clutches of the loan sharks. But the neighbors, everybody said, this is crazy. Why did he give you the money? Nobody gives money to people like that. So then I thought, why don't they continue if it, if it makes so much impact in people's life? If you, your $27 can make or generate so much happiness in so many people, why shouldn't I do more of it? So I wanted to more of it, do more of it. So I went to the bank, wrong place. I didn't know that. <laughs> I, I thought they will jump at the idea. See how innocent I was about banking? <laughs> I went there, told him, told the bank manager, look, you can help these people. Tiny loans, so small, you don't even miss it that you have ever had this money. It's such a small amount of money. But it makes so much difference in their life. Instead of going to the loan sharks, they will come to you. And you will lend money. And I'll tell them where to find the money. No way, he said. Impossible. So my learning began about banking. And I tried to explain to him later on to his bosses and bosses and everybody. I said, this is a funny institution you created. You see, I had an advantage. Advantage was I can say anything I want because I, know, I didn't know anything. <laughs> so whatever comes to my mind, I can say that. Because nothing telling me that, oh, you're violating this, you're, doing, you're not mindful of that. I didn't have to worry. I said, it's a very funny institution you've built because you should be lending money to people who don't have money. <laughs> rather than lending money who has already a lot of money. It doesn't make sense to me. They said, no, oh, no, that's not the way. You are wrong. I said, well, why should I be wrong? Doesn't it make sense that to lend money to people who don't have money rather than the other way? But that's what the banking is all over the world. The more money you have, more money you get. Richer you are, more important client you are. And it means also the reverse. If you have nothing, if you have little, you don't get anything. It, I couldn't accept that proposition, how it should work. I said, why don't you do that? So anyway, it's a long story. After eight months of this running around, blaming the banking system, blaming in a, in a very nasty way. I was trying to be very nasty to them so that they can wake up to me. But they couldn't feel anything. They said they are doing the right thing. This is that's a crazy guy who's shouting around. So I kept shouting around, made a lot of acquisitions. Two basic points I made against the banking. I said, you are absolutely wrong in the whole design of your banking for the reason I just explained. You refuse money to people who don't have money. And you are absolutely wrong. You refuse to lend money to women. Even if she's the richest woman in the country, you don't lend her because you're always lending money to men. The second point, they were very vocal, protesting. I said, no matter what you protest, your evidence doesn't show that you are right because the evidence shows I have all the statistics, all the information of banking in Bangladesh. Not even 1% of their borrowers out of all the hundreds of thousands or millions of borrowers they have in the country, not even 1% happen to be women. So I said, you cannot justify that. They, even that they, they tried to justify, I brought the counter arguments to that. Ultimately, as I was not giving up, I came up with another idea to open that door. I offered myself as a guarantor because I learned a little bit of banking in the meantime because I'm always debating with them. So I saw a kind of a legal way to get in. That's to offer myself as a guarantor. I said, I'll sign every single piece of paper you give me. I won't even look at it. I'll just sign. You give the money. <laughs> so this is a very legal procedure for them. So finally, they accepted it. But put the ceiling that you can take a total of this much money with your signature on top of it. I said, I don't care. I'll keep on taking the money. So I started that. And I came up with simple ideas. So when you have no ideas, you come up with something that you feel it could work. It's just a hunch. 
And with those hunches, I did it there and took my students around to start the whole thing. Luckily, it started working. And the money that I gave was coming back. And 100% of the money came back. I was very excited. Then the bank manager, I thought bank manager now will change the mind because he's seen that it works. He was totally unimpressed. <laughs> As if nothing happened. Here, we are bubbling with excitement. He said, so what? You did it in one village. In one village, one professor can do all kinds of magic. <laughs> that doesn't change the world. I said, what should I do then? He said, yeah, please do two villages to find out it works. I said, OK, I'll do two villages. <laughs> so we went ahead, did it two villages. It worked again, exactly 100%, no problem. And we had no problem whatsoever. Then he still remains unimpressed. He said, one village and the two villages are the same thing. <laughs> so I said, what does it mean? He said, hey, you should do at least five villages. Otherwise, you don't know what's happening. So we, me and my students, we go right back, keep working. And it works, and it works, and it works, all the villages. Every time it works, he raises the number of villages. <laughs> so we go ahead and do it again. More and more. In the meantime, we are getting excited. Not that it's, we are feeling kind of bored about it. The more it works, more excited we get. Finally, I realized, after going through many, many villages, I started telling my student, if I do the whole world, he will not change his mind. <laughs> Probably will ask me to go to the Mars. <laughs> because the simple reason is his mind is made. It's a totally made. You cannot change it. No matter, you see it right in front of your eyes, but you won't accept it because your mind doesn't see it anymore. So the whole struggle for me was the mindset. Not only in that particular case of the branch manager or the bank manager, it is everywhere that I went. It's the mindset always comes back and opposes you. Because even if you say, look, it's not true. No, no. Maybe this time it was different. It was an exception. This is it. So we kept on working. Lots of opposition to it building up. But we were so excited that we are not looking at the opposition. We are looking at the fact that it's happening. Since bank was getting more and more reluctant, the more it becomes successful, bank becomes more reluctant to support this with all the signatures and everything. Then I thought, why am I doing all this to please him? convince him. Who is he to decide what I want to do? I decide what I want to do. He may be blind. He may be deaf. I don't care. So since we see it very clearly, let's move on. How do we do that? We need the money from them. So another idea came. At that time, it looked like an impossible thing to happen. But we said, at least we should try. Why don't we create a bank ourselves? So we came up with an idea of writing down the whole idea of creating a bank, a very special kind of bank, which will lend money only to poor people. When I go for the license for this bank, because you need permission from the central bank, you need permission from the ministry, still, they said, are you crazy? You want to create a bank for the poor people? <laughs> we have enough of trouble creating, creating banks for the rich people. They don't pay back. This is what happens in Bangladesh. The rich people don't pay back. So I said, that's good. Because worse comes to worse, poor people will not pay back either. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the problem with you? Luckily, the poor people will take very small loans, not the millions of dollars of loans like the rich. They will take tiny, tiny loans. Anyway, they missed the point. But we continued, finally. We became a bank. We started in 1976. We created a bank in 1983. And then we started expanding, expanding ourselves. Today, it's a nationwide bank. We have over 8 million borrowers. 97% are women. And the p poor people who borrow from the bank are the owners of the bank. This is another little thing that we added to that feature. It's not only lend money to the poor people also owned by the poor people. They are the ones who sit in the board of the Crimean Bank. So 
And all the money that we lend out comes from the deposit that we take. We don't take money from the government. We don't take money from the other sources, international sources, or anybody. We just take deposits and lend money to people, same money. And then bank makes profit. Profit goes back to the borrowers because they are the owners. So they get the dividend and so on. We lend out over $100 million each month. And that money is growing again. Each month, it becomes bigger and bigger. And all this money coming from those depositors. We never had any shortage of money. Along the way, we encourage every child of these families to go to school. Because these are all illiterate families, totally illiterate, cannot read, cannot write. So we said, well, at least what we can do, we can encourage them to send their children to school. So all our staff worked very hard to make sure every child goes to school. And we achieved that big accomplishment, having 100% of all the children of poor families within the Grameen Bank to be in school. And then they continued in school. We encourage them to continue, not to drop out. Then we see gradually they are coming to the college level. High school is okay. It doesn't cost much because it's a free education. But the, by the time you come to the college, you have to go to a distance. You need to spend money on the child. Parents don't have that money. And immediately we announce that Grameen Bank will give all the financing to every child in Grameen families who go to for higher education. Entire cost will be borne by Grameen Bank as an education law. So thousands and thousands of them started going to medical schools, engineering schools, universities. So we have now many, many young people with degrees from the universities, from the medical and engineering and all this, professional schools. Many of them have completed their PhDs. It's a very strange situation. So when I go to the village, I enjoy it, seeing them. Every villager, or every visitor goes to the village today it becomes a standard routine to meet these young people who are in the universities because their mothers is illiterate. Their parents, all of them are illiterate. So when I go, I see a young girl and the mother working, receiving me, very happy, beaming with sm smiles. And I ask, oh, you are helping your mother. What do you do? Did you go to school? She said, no, I'm a doctor. <laughs> I'd finished my medical school with education loan from your bank. Oh, I said, I'm very happy. So what are you doing here? I said, I came here because I heard that you are coming to our village and you'll be visiting us. And I thought, I'll see you because I never saw you before. So I look at her, I look at her mother. They look just alike, just a mother and a daughter. One is younger, another is older. That's it. It's exactly the same. A thought comes to my mind every time I see that situation. Her mother could have been a doctor too. There's nothing wrong with her mother. Nothing missing in her mother. But she, not only she never become a doctor, she never even went to school to learn the alphabets. Is it her fault? No, that's not her fault. Her daughter got the opportunity to go to school. She went to school and she finished her medical school and you know, she's a doctor. Her mother got nothing. So who created this difference? The person created the difference? The mother voluntarily said, I will remain a poor. I don't want to be a doctor. No. She would love to go to the, fight as much as she could to become a doctor or an engineer or whatever is available. So you see right away, poverty is not created by the person. It's not one example. You can go millions of such examples. It'll tell you the same story. Poverty is not created by the person. Poverty is created by the system. By the way you have designed our societies, by the way we created our theoretical structures, like we study in our schools, that's what we all do. They created poverty not the person. Concepts, policies, institutions. Look at the banking. Why banking decided they only give money to the people who already have money? They, have, they protected themselves by saying that it cannot be done the other way. 
Now we have we've been doing it for the last 32, 33 years. And it works. How do you protect your institutions saying that we cannot do that? Not only we do it in Bangladesh, we do it right there in New York City. Exactly with the same way. It works as good as Bangladesh. We have branches in Brooklyn, we have branches in Bronx, we have branches in Manhattan, we have branches in Queens. And every single one has the same result. Very close to 100% repayment, no collateral, no lawyers in our system. It's a lawyer free banking. <laughs> but it works. Even in the financial crisis where the big banks, big lawyers, all the collaterals were collapsing, our work in New York City is flourishing. We have no problem. So that's the whole issue. How do we redesign those things? If you want to eliminate poverty, we have to have a different kind of a structure of our system. We have to build a new kind of banking, which is an inclusive banking, which doesn't reject anybody. Everybody is welcome. We know how to do business with you. It's possible. It's not a pipe dream or something. It's done. Not just in one corner of the world, it's global. Then we talk about the concept. The concept that I wrote the book about, social business. I'm saying the whole idea of business is wrong. Economists went absolutely wrong in designing the concept and the theor theoretical framework. They imagined all human beings want to make money. This is their passion. They enjoyed making money. And for all their lives, all they do, they go into business, make money. The more money makes, the more successful they are. Successful, quote unquote. I said, that's fine with me. I have no objection to that. So, but what about the other things? They have no answer for that. Because they imagine all human beings are focused on making money. I said, that doesn't sound right. Because you interpret human beings as a one-dimensional being. All they do is make money. I said, human beings are not robots. You are trying to create robots among us. All we do, we go to school, work very hard, get our big degrees. To do what? To find jobs. Jobs mean what? Work for the company. What does it mean? Work hard for the success of the company, meaning shareholders make a lot of money. I work hard for all my life, shareholders make money. It doesn't make good sense for that. I said, okay, do you like it? Go ahead. I have no problem. The problem is I don't want to see this is the only thing we do. Because human beings are not one dimensional. That's my point. Human beings are multidimensional. Human beings are selfish, that's no problem with that. But human beings are also selfless. But economists never recognize that selfless part of human being. They kept the selfish part of human being. Everything is for me. So I have no time to look at anything else because I'm busy grabbing everything for me. And I said, this is the greatest thing that the society can have, the world can have. Uh, we have kind of eulogized Fine, but what about the other part, selfless part of it? What selfless part? I said the part which kind of hungers on doing things for others. It's a natural reaction of people. Oh, you go outside of economics. You're not in economics anymore. You become a philanthropist. You go out and create foundations to do that. Not in economics. I said, what's wrong with economics? Economics only treat part of the human being, not the whole human being. You pride yourself, you are a social science. You don't sound like a social science. You keep the society out of it. <laughs> How can you be a social science keeping the society out of it? Keeping the whole human being out of it. Take a fraction of the human being. So I said, why don't we build another business on the basis of selflessness? Well, that's all I'm saying. I'm not saying you dismantle the whole theory. I'm saying add another piece into it. If it works, fine. If it doesn't work, Nothing is missed. And that is a business based on selflessness, meaning everything I do is for others, nothing for me. Just the kind of opposite of what 
we do the conventional business. Everything is for me, nothing for others. In selfless business, everything is for others, nothing for me. By my own choice, nobody is forced me. So I said, people, people like that, they will do it. If they don't like it, they won't do it. It won't, it won't harm anybody. So I called it social business. It's a non-loss, non-dividend company to solve a problem of the society. In all my life, what I did, not only the Grameen Bank, I created many, many, many other companies, some 40 companies. It became a habit with me. Every time I see a problem, I immediately come up with an idea of a business to solve that problem. So every company I created is like that. I never owned a company. I create a company, but never own it. Like Grameen Bank I created, I never owned it. I, not, I don't have a single share in Grameen Bank. I decided right from the beginning by the design, the borrowers should own it. And I'm only an employee of the bank. borrowers who are the shareholders. And I enjoy it. I love it. I see no problem. If happiness is the purpose, this is a great happiness. Why can't we? If that is what we are looking for, we should look for all the sources of happiness, not just one source of happiness. So this is the social business. When I talk about it, people say, ah, oh, no. People, some people like you are crazy. You do things like differently, but not ordinary people, everyday people. We want to make money. I said, you're wrong. We are busy with making money because there's nothing else to do. <laughs> if you're given the opportunity, if you're given the opportunity to do other things, you'll see what a rush to do all those things. And social business will become such an exciting thing for everybody because it brings so much pleasure in doing things that I have solved this problem. I have solved problems of 10 people who used to be on welfare. I created a social business to take them out of welfare. Well, they are now enjoying their life because they are out of welfare. And I created a business for them. And that was my social business. And now that I have done this, a social business to 10 people out of welfare, and it is successfully done. This business keeps running because it's self-sustaining. We don't have to take fund fundraising, dinners, and so on to keep it running because it's a business. In a business, it runs by itself. It's a self-willing machine. So it goes on, and these 10 people continue with their life. They have no problem. Then other people say, hey, this is possible. People can get out of welfare very easily if I could create this social business. So another 10 people go out. So it's now repetition. Because you, in each time of repetition, you improve a little bit. Because you learned a lot. First one was a crude one. Second one is a little bit better. Third one is very efficient. Same thing. And somebody said, ah, you did it the wrong way. I'll design it this way. See how quickly, for the same investment, for the same effort, I can take 20 out of welfare. That's a beautiful idea. It's all creativity. But the structure is a business. And I create the business not for making myself rich, because if I'm trying a business, building a business to make money, I'll never think about getting 10 people out of welfare. Because I have more opportunities to make money somewhere else. At least put my money in the stock market. That will give me more return. Here I don't get anything. So why should I be involved with it? But if you want to do, create a social business, you start with this problem. Because the whole purpose of a social business is to solve a problem. So we make a list of problems. Each one of us can make our list of problems. You see, which one I want to solve first? Let's create a business out of it. Single mothers. Let's say we say single mother is such a big problem. They have such a tough life. Why don't we create a social business to take 10 single mothers out of all the difficulties she has? She has a decent life, with dignity she lives. Her children get a good life for themselves. And that's the idea of my social business. I created that. And it works beautiful. And I feel so happy. They feel so happy. I miss nothing. People say, ah, if you're doing that, you'll be not making money, so you're missing out all the fun of making money. I said, you're missing out all the fun of making, solving problems. And particularly today's young people like you, making money is not as exciting as it used to be with us, our generation. Because at that time, difficulties are everywhere. 
Today, most of the young people in many of the countries, they came up already everything made. They are not looking for things that they don't have. They already have. What do you do with your life? So, excitement about making. See, when you make your first million, second million is not that exciting. <laughs> so gradually, excitement goes. You have billions of dollars. Now, the billionaires are signing up. When they die, they'll give half, half their wealth for charity. What, what you, you don't take your money with you when you go. So making money has a limit. It has a purpose. It's not, it can be a means to something. It cannot be end. Today, economists tell us that the money making is a means. Money making is an end. Doesn't make good sense to me. If we have both kind of business, money making business and social business, then we can restate the whole thing. Making money through the money making business is a means. Using the money to solve the problem is the end. We are here in this planet for a very short period. And everybody at one time or other say, how do I leave a signature on this planet? What will be my signature? So that I know that I was here for this period, year such and such to year such and such. If I make 10 billion, 100 billion dollars and left, that doesn't look like a signature. Signature is something you have done for this, something done for the society, something done for the people, that you change their life and make a significant contribution to it. Even if it's not the whole planet, it could be 10 people, 20 people, five people. I have done that, this is my contribution. And I led the way. I opened up a completely different direction. Each one of us has its capacity. If you think, oh, I'm not that smart. You don't, you're not talking about being smart. You're talking about being interested. If you're interested, it can be done. All it needs is creativity, that's all. All it needs some way to have to think that how do, why don't I do that? So we have created lots of these companies in Bangladesh. Now many other countries are coming up to do that. In Bangladesh, we have not only we have done it ourselves, we also have joint ventures with big companies because they became interested after my previous book got published. They said, oh, can we do some social business? Of course you can do social business. So what will be our social business? So we gave them ideas and they loved that. So first one came with a Danone company, the milk products company, French, French company. So we had a Grameen Danone company to produce yogurt to solve the problem of malnutrition among the children of Bangladesh. We make a fortified yogurt with lots of uh, macronutrients in it so that the children can become a healthy child. Each one of them just by eating this yogurt, it's a very delicious yogurt, they love it. We make it very cheap so that everybody can eat it. If a child eats only two cups, two cups of this yogurt a week within seven days and continue it same way for eight months or nine months, the child becomes fully healthy child. No trace of malnourishment anymore. Why can't we do that? It is done in a business way because Grameen Danone is a business, but business for a purpose, for a very specific objective to reduce the malnutrition among the children in Bangladesh. If it works in Bangladesh, it will work anywhere. And you don't need to apply for uh, foundation money to run it. It's investment money. Anybody who would like to invest in that because they can get their investment back after the company gets running. So you got your money back, but in the meantime, you solve the problem. So we have water company for bringing drinking water with a big company, Veolia, as a joint venture. We have joint venture with Japanese company, Uniqlo. I don't know, Uniqlo is not probably working here, but it's in Europe, it's in Japan. It's one of the largest chain of clothes and apples and also fashions and so on. So we have joint venture with a tiny company in Bangladesh, us, with the Uniqlo, a giant company, global company, to bring their products to the poorest people. What are the products they're going to produce in this? Sanitary napkins for the women in the villages. You know how many diseases they contact using dirty clothes and things of that sort? Very simple solution. But nobody thinks about that, oh, who cares? Because we make money producing this fancy thing, it's a fashion. We spend one dollar to produce it, charge hundred dollars to sell it, we make money. 
Why should I go for this poor woman? And that's a social business. What others will not be interested, they become interested, they become this is highest priority item because it saves people's life, people's misery. So this will be one. Warm clothing for the people who cannot afford to have warm clothing in winter. So that old people don't have to die in winter or children don't have to die in because of the extreme cold. So those are the kind of things, elements. We have joint venture with Adidas to produce shoes for the poor people so that nobody will go barefoot. That's the promise. Nobody in the world should go barefoot. As a shoe company, this is a statement we, I suggest to them, to them as a mission statement, saying nobody in the world should go without shoes. As a shoe company, it's our responsibility to produce shoes affordable to even to the poorest person. So after long preparation of that, finally they will be test marketing these shoes in Bangladesh called Reebok with the Reebok brand name on top of it. And I was suggesting to them, you make shoes in a way it shouldn't cost to the people more than one euro with Reebok shoes with one euro. And that's your social business. And design the whole company in such a way it becomes a sustainable company, not a charity company. Charity will take you only one step, but we have to go thousand steps. Only thousand steps can be done only with business principles. So that's another company. So we have company after company. We have joint venture with BASF, which is a, one of the top most uh, chemical company in the world, to produce mosquito nets to save people from malaria. So each of the social businesses is related to health issues, water, nutrition, sanitation, and you name it, the parasitic diseases, shoes protect you from parasitic diseases. So lots of children in Bangladesh and many countries have bloated the stomachs filled with parasites because they are empty, uh, they are barefoot. So they contact all those parasites into their body. So if you are wearing shoes and feeling comfortable with it, you protect yourself. So healthcare becomes one big issue. Environment becomes another big issue as a social business. We have a company called Grameen Energy to bring solar energy in Bangladesh as a social business. We sell 1,000 plus solar home system every month in Bangladesh. It's a social business. We don't lose any money. We make money, but not for anybody to take it to keep the company expanding so that we can move on. So imagine 1,000 solar home system in Bangladeshi conditions of villages. So what you have given to them that they are paying their own cash money to buy your product and generating electricity through the solar energy. And we are also improve, selling the improved solar cooking system. The, there's just a, not so, solar also, just a fuel, fuel wood stoves so that women can change their cooking stove to a more improved one so that you don't have to inhale the fume all the time. And your use of uh, fuel would get really cut down by more than 50% if you use this. Effic fuel efficiency increases so much. You do the same cooking, but use less fuel wood. Less, half the trees are not chopped off every meal you cook. Because when 150 million people eat one meal, there's a lot of trees are cut off to have this one meal. So if you can have 50% reduction in that, it's a lot of trees saved. So you can go on and on and on. Now we are trying to bring all these social business ideas in Haiti, because Haiti, you're all familiar. I'm saying that relief will not change the country. Relief is a kind of temporary thing. It's very important, but temporary. You have to build it up. I said, let's go and build social businesses so that young people love to do that. We are inviting the Haitians, wherever they're working, come back. Let's work together, build businesses, social businesses, so that we can make whole Haiti as a beautiful green country. We can do the afforestation as a social business. It could be covered with green trees as a social business. So we can do many things. It's a question of ideas that you can do. So this is, if you, <coughs> If you, instead of just grumbling about all the difficulties, all the, all the bad things that happen, let's get involved and solve it. We have the technology in our hand. 
this technology human being never had in the history of mankind. What use we are making of this technology? Just fancy gadgets in our pockets, in our table, that's it? Or it has some meaning in the societal aspect. And what who is use controlling this technology? Of course, this technology is owned by the companies. And they use this technology to make money for themselves, which is good. But I said, if you could create social businesses with them, then we can bring all these technology, that powerful technology, to solve the problem of the world. Every single one. Healthcare becomes a very simple proposition once we bring the technology into the healthcare. People don't have to leave their home to get the healthcare. Today's technology allows any doctor to be in contact with the patient and all the information, all the diagnostic can be delivered at home. It's possible. All you need is just a kind of a small tablet side thing with icons, you push it, it becomes one different machine. You take all the measurements, you it ultrasono, it becomes ultrasono. You change the, send the images to the doctor that you are talking to in her desk or in his desk, all the things are coming. She's talking to the patient. Everything can be done. It's a question of putting our mind into it and it becomes very cheap because you don't have to go any place. You don't have to spend any money. So bulk of the healthcare should be done at home level. Then you protect the people. The, ba the basic premise of healthcare should be to keep the healthy people healthy. That's the basic healthcare. And then the moment a healthy person deviates from good health, catch him right away or catch her right away. Immediate detection and immediate treatment right away so that we can build this up. It's possible. Now we are working towards doing that, bringing this technology into the healthcare system, redesign the entire healthcare system as a social business so that it pays for itself. At the same time, nobody is making money out of it. It's possible. And we can reach out to every single person. Nobody will be excluded because it will be made affordable for everybody, but as a social business. So you can move on doing that. In the process, you can create a whole new world where nobody has to remain a poor person because it's not in the person. It is externally imposed on that person. If we clear out all the external imposition part of it, everybody will be as good as anybody else. We will have a world without any poverty. And that's why I keep saying that we should get ready to create poverty museums. <laughs> because there will be any poor person in the world very soon if you put our mind into it. I was just being interviewed a little while ago, and the question is, do you really believe that this world would be if a world without poverty? I said, I'm absolutely sure it would be. I said, do you think people will believe it? I said, people didn't believe that we'll go to the moon. But we did it. People didn't believe that we'll have a whole telephone in our pocket, <laughs> whole computer in our pocket. When I was a student, we used to have computer centers. Whole building is designated as a computer center. We had the cards, punch cards. Do you remember those days? We are still here. Now the whole, that big house, the computer that contained is a fraction of the tiny little thing you're carrying in your pocket. But that's true. That's, if all these, is, is, is it more difficult? to get a human being out of poverty than sending a person in the moon? It's a ridiculous idea that we don't have to believe that. It is possible. Simply, we have not got our act right. So this is what the chance, redesign the system. I'm only proposing one of my ideas, but that doesn't mean that's the end of ideas. You'll have 101 ideas to do that. So let's get together and bring those ideas and make it a change. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.